All right. Um, again, welcome everyone. Um, as you can see there, uh, we're going to be talking about um, two awesome things that um, I enjoy taking part in, and that is communion and baptism, and how these are some identifying markers when it comes to um, us identifying or being a part of who Jesus is and the church that he gave his life for. I want to first um, share something that I came across of a uh, little girl asking her mom, as she was preparing dinner, um, why is it that you cut the ends off of the meat before you cook it? To which mom responds, well, I'm pretty sure that's so that the meat can stay tender and all the juices can go inside. But why don't you go and ask your grandmother? So she goes and she asks her grandmother, Grandma, why is it that you and mom cut the ends off of the meat before you put it in the oven? And she says, well, I'm pretty sure that's just so that it stays tender and juicy and so that it can all go in there. Look, you know, at least that's the way that I've always done it. Why don't you go ask great-grandma? So the little girl goes and she asks great-grandma. She's frustrated at this point. She's about over it. You know, she says, great-grandma, why is it that you and grandma and mom all cut the ends off of the meat before you put it in the oven? She said, well, back whenever I was cooking, the pan wasn't big enough. You ever feel like there's some things that happen and you don't even know why they happen? It's just the way that things are done? I sometimes think that that is how communion and baptism are handled in some churches. Sometimes they're just part of the service and, you know, part of, part of celebration, but sometimes people don't exactly know why it happens. Sometimes people don't exactly know why these things happen. Look, there are so many habits and traditions that if we're not careful, we can forget certain things and why they are done. Um, water baptism and communion are known as two ordinances or two practices um, of the church and things that happen. And so I'm hoping to just share with you a little bit today. And let's not have the attitude right, you know, right now, Pastor, I've been taking communion since you were in diapers. Look, let's not have that attitude right now, okay? We don't need none of that negativity up in here, okay? Hopefully you're going to learn something, take something away. If not, we should be excited and um, thanking Jesus that someone is going to learn something today. And that should excite us as we're making disciples and all of us have a part. Because maybe, you know, my hope is that there's some people in here that they don't know exactly what communion is exactly what water baptism is or what it means and so that's why I share on these things from time to time um, is because I never want to assume that everyone in the room uh, already knows what I'm talking about I don't want to do that you would be hard-pressed to go back in any sermon and find find me sharing the phrase you know the story why because my hope is there's people in the room who don't know the story that they don't know the story. And that's why I'm going to take two or three minutes. You're like, oh my gosh, we already know about David and Goliath enough. I'm going to take two or three minutes because hopefully someone doesn't know anything about the stories. And VeggieTales didn't quite get it 100% right. Okay? Sorry, homeschool parents. But that's, it wasn't exactly right. Um, water baptism communion is... Um, uh, one of the Assemblies of God fundamental truths. We have 16 fundamental truths or um, uh, uh, supporting scriptural ideas that we stick to, that we adhere to, and water baptism and communion are one of those kind of lumped in together as the ordinances of the church. It's number six on the list of 16. Here's what it says. The ordinance of baptism by immersion is commanded by the scriptures. All who repent and believe on Christ as Savior and Lord are to be baptized. Thus they declare to the world that they have died with Christ and that they have also been raised with him to walk in newness of life. So oftentimes, the biggest question that I get, sorry, my ATD is getting the best of me. I don't have OCD, that's a disorder. I have ATD, attention to detail, who's with me, right? So yeah, see, some of you are gonna start using that now. Somebody's like, you're OCD, no, I'm ATD, that's a disorder. I bind that in the name of Jesus. <laughs> sorry, back to the message here. Water baptism, people oftentimes answer, well, why should I get baptized? And my first response oftentimes is because Jesus did. 
And I mean, really, end of discussion. Like Jesus did, so you should. If you're claiming to be a Christian, then you should be baptized in water. That's true. It's scripturally correct. But sometimes we need more than that uh, because not everybody is going to be all on board with that answer early in their faith journey. So I want to... Um, take five questions about water baptism out of Matthew chapter 3. Uh, and the first one is, if someone were to say, hey, what is water baptism? What is it? Like, I don't know what it is. I have no idea what it is. Um, water baptism, uh, the word translated baptized speaks of being immersed or completely underwater. So whenever we kind of do the word study on the word that they use for baptized or baptizo, and we trace it back. It says, hey, that there's going to be immersion, is that there's going to be full submersion that happens with that. A second question is, where does the instruction come from? So we see baptism, but where does it come from? Uh, the first thing that I want to look at, as I just mentioned, is Jesus' example. Jesus gave us an example of water baptism in verse 13 through 17 it says then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John but John tried to deter him saying I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me Jesus replied let it be so now it is also proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness as soon as Jesus was baptized he went up out of the water at that moment Heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. So we have Jesus being baptized here to set the example. Now, if you've been around church any amount of time, you're going to know that Jesus was sinless. He didn't sin. He didn't do anything wrong. So why be baptized essentially he wanted to fulfill righteousness this is exactly what he said there right this is being done to fulfill righteousness um, a public statement that he was making a public statement to say hey um, I want to be set apart for God's purpose I want to be set apart for God's plan so that's why I'm being baptized he also did it to identify with sinners Never a sinner, wasn't a sinner, but wanted to identify with them to say, hey, you're going to go through this, just know that I've been through this as well. This is one of the, unlike parents, this is Jesus saying, hey, do as I say and as I do. All right, parents, sometimes we want to say, you know, do as I say, don't worry about what I do, right? Uh, Jesus is saying, no, just, just do both. Do what I say do what I do. It was also a opportunity for Jesus to associate with the movement of God calling everyone to repentance, of God saying, hey, you need to accept who Jesus is as your Savior. You need to follow God. And so some, some of this comes up, and I've had these, well, are we sure Jesus was sinless because he was baptized, and the reason for baptism is for sinners and the things that come out with that? And yes, this is just Jesus um, kind of setting the path for us. It's also a command of Jesus that Jesus gives. So it's not just the example, but he says, if you jump over to Matthew 28, in verse 16, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, now here's what you need to know about the scripture. Jesus has already been buried Right, he died on a cross, he's buried in a tomb, and this is during the time that he comes back and he hangs out on earth before going to heaven where he is now. So this here is his time where he's hanging out on earth, um, freaking some people out along the way, right? And we're like, hey, here, touch my hands, right? Um, you know, walks through a, you know, door. And so um, here's this happening. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So, gee, look, this was so, baptism is so important. 
that when Jesus comes back after being raised from the dead in a limited amount of time that he has, he says, hey, people need to be baptized. Think about how important that is, that, that within these you know, few short days that he's back, he takes out this portion to say, hey, baptism is so important. So verse 19, baptize them. Verse 20, teaching them to observe. So Jesus gave an example and Jesus gave a command. So then another, another question that comes to mind is when should I be baptized? If we go back to Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, it talks about repenting for the kingdom of heaven is, is near. Right, you know, John's going, declaring, saying, hey, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Verse 6 talks about the people being baptized in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. So understanding that repentance or a turning away from the life you're living and a life that's focused now on God has to happen. And then um, uh, confessing those sins. Verse 8, I love verse 8. That we've got to produce fruit, actions, we've got to produce actions, we've got to produce deeds, we've got to produce words in keeping with repentance. Now this is one that I love because um, sometimes whenever there's a situation that happens within church and someone is on a journey and things are going great in their faith, but they slip up and they mess up along the way. And maybe this is a person who is in some sort of a leadership position, um, uh, you know, maybe, you know, staff, maybe, maybe worship team, maybe something like that. And then there's something that happens to where we're like, hey, time out. We need you to take a break from that. And you need to be able to, whatever that situation is that happened, you need to be reconciled back to God. But in the meantime, you need to take a break from ministry to where a person will say, well, yeah, but why? But I'm saved and I love Jesus, to which we can say, yeah, but your uh, fruit isn't being displayed the way that it should be. And I've had this conversation as a pastor with many people throughout the years as they've slipped up along the way. Now, we didn't bring them before the church and chastise them and throw fruit at them or anything like that, okay? But there's been a personal conversation with that person that said, hey, you know what you did was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. There's going to be some time to take away. And as you're considering coming back, we want to see some fruit to show the repentance. So I love about that particular scripture. And whenever we're ready to be baptized, we're saying, hey, the fruit you're going to see from this point on, it's going to be fruit that is going to reflect Jesus. The things I do is going to reflect God. And verse 11 talks about baptizing with water for repentance. We see a great pattern in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Peter says to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're baptized after we repent of our sins and become a disciple or a follower of Christ. Whenever you see that within scripture, to become a disciple, to be a disciple, don't think that it's just reserved for the first 12. Disciple is just a disciplined follower of Christ. So I'm a disciple of Jesus. If you know Jesus and you call him Lord and you call him Savior, you're a disciple of Jesus. So let's not just think that some of that was just for the first century people. Fourth question I always talk about or bring, bring up with water baptism is what does it mean? This is something that if you've been around church, you're, you're going to know this saying. This is an outward sign of an inward change. We're saying this is a public way for me to show people that something inside of me has changed. Baptism means that we're following Christ's teaching in Matthew chapter 28. Baptism means that we have a good conscience toward the word of God. According to 1 Peter chapter 3, it says baptism also shows that, hey, we've given up our will to Jesus. In that moment, we're saying, Jesus, you are in control. It is you who I want to live for. And you've come out of a dead life of sin, according to Colossians 2. So, so those are the reasons um, for what baptism means. But let's talk about what does baptism do for Christians? What does it do for Christians? See, don't think that your baptism ends the moment that you step out of the tank and dry off. It doesn't. Your baptism doesn't end there. Because baptism promises, according to 2 Corinthians 5, that if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation, the old is gone, and the new has come. 
I think I've got the image back there for our baptism image. Do we have that? The in, the in with the old, out with the new? Did I put that up there somewhere so we can show everybody? There we go. So this is not something backwards. Where you're like, no, it's supposed to be in with the new, out with the old, right? No, because as we go into the tank, that's the old man or the old person or the old self going in, and we're coming out with the new. So this, is, this has kind of become our, you know, baptism thought process is, is in with the old, out with the new, because that's what 2 Corinthians tells us, that we're in Christ and we're a new creation and the old has gone. If you're not familiar with the Assemblies of God, just want to let you know uh, that it is not traditional, it is not practice in the Assemblies of God to baptize uh, babies or toddlers. Um, as I've shared here, uh, baptism is for the purpose um, of repentance of sin. And um, though sometimes we think that that baby keeping us up all night is sin, it's just the nature of the baby, okay? And it's what they do. Um, we do not uh, practice uh, the baptism of babies or toddlers. And the biggest reason, um, aside of it not personally meaning anything, to the baby or to the child if they're super young. Another reason is is because scripture doesn't give us any example. Some people wants to point to, well, yeah, whenever the jailer was saved and then, and then he was baptized and his family was baptized. It didn't tell us anything about a baby being part of that. If today was the day for me and my family to be saved and baptized, we don't have any babies. We've got teenagers and adults who, who, who can understand sin and that we've messed up along the way. What this has created for me throughout many years is the opportunity to baptize some people as teenagers, as adults, um, as um, even children who know what it means at the age of whatever them and their parents are going to decide that to be, is an opportunity for them to be baptized according to Scripture when maybe tradition of family or tradition of faith had them baptized as a child when they were sprinkled. Hear me out. We're not saying you're evil and you're going to hell if that's the only baptism there that you ever have. What we're saying is when will there come a point to where you're going to say, hey, I want to identify with Jesus through baptism. And I've had the conversation, especially as a youth pastor, to be able to sit down with teenagers and their parents because I would talk about baptism as a youth pastor and kids would sign up and I'd talk to them and find, find out because a, um, whenever I was a youth pastor for four years in Ohio, we were in a very heavy Catholic area. And Catholics do a lot of baby baptisms. And so many times I would sit down with our student and their parents, and I would simply ask the student one question. What did it mean to you to be baptized when you were a baby? And the response was, well, I didn't even know unless grandma or mom told me or I saw a picture somewhere. And then I would ask the student, what would it mean to you now? And they would share what it would mean to them now. To which I would ask the parents, parents, are you okay with that? Any good parent is going to say yes. I made sure to reassure them he's not, he or she's not joining the church. They're just having a part of their faith journey. So um, just so you're kind of clear on that, um, uh, you know, as to why we hold off until they're older children, teenagers, or adults. I want to talk about three things that Christian baptism does. Christian baptism plunges us into the death and resurrection of Jesus. See, the going under is being in um, the symbolism of dying to Christ and coming up is being resurrected with Christ um, or, you know, kind of in that partnership of the death and the resurrection of Christ. Um, Christian baptism uh, really helps to just begin to let us um, see some things. And I think that every step that we take in our faith journey from the moment that we're saved to the moment that we're baptized to the moment that we feel that calling into ministry to maybe the moment that we're filled with the Holy Spirit um, to the moments where breakthrough happens. Every single time we become more and more and more in tune with the Holy Spirit. And so for some people at their water baptism, they're going to, you know, after that happens, they're going to feel this new connection or this new um, 
power is the way that Acts talks about, right? You know, is that there's power available, you know, not saying that that's the baptism in the Spirit that happens, but there's a deeper connection with the Holy Spirit that happens every step. And so then water baptism brings that step to be able to be a little more in tune with the Holy Spirit. So will walking in your call to ministry. So will surrendering things to the Holy Spirit that he says, hey, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to say that. I don't want you to go there. Every step, I want to encourage you, every step that you take in your faith journey to get closer to God um, gets you more in tune with the Holy Spirit. Water baptism is supposed to have a profound impact on the way that we act. It's, it's a public confession that we're committing our lives to Christ. It's not perfection by any means, but things need to change within our lives so that, so that people are seeing something different about us because there's something fantastic that just makes us, I don't know about you, but there's been a lot of times on my faith journey where I'm like, am I doing anything right? Anybody else ever have that struggle or is that just me? Like, am I doing anything right? And when someone says something along the lines of, What's different about you or, you know, what causes you to react like that? Then you kind of feel like, okay, maybe I am doing some things right. Now, we should never look to that or need that for clarification of salvation. But those things are nice to be able to hear. Water baptism is one of those ways to do that and to move forward in that. Uh, Christian baptism embodies God's challenge to repentance and faith. Uh, baptism cannot be conducted without some expression of faith and repentance. It's not just that, you know, because me, whenever I was a child, I went to um, uh, church uh, mainly for the reason um, to be out of the house one, sometimes two days a week from an abusive stepfather. Um, if you're not aware, uh, whenever I was a child and lived in Indiana, um, I had a stepdad who wasn't the uh, greatest of stepdads. Um, to put it nicely, he was a tool. Um, and um, there was a period that I can remember where um, I was disciplined for something that caused me to miss school for three days because I couldn't sit down. So thankfully, I was able to find this incredible couple um, where we ended up in this uh, uh, Baptist church for a period of time. I'm still connected with them on Facebook. We still keep up, um, named Pete and Karen Wethington. And for me, going to church was an escape from him. It was an escape from that environment. And there was an opportunity where I'm like, oh, there's people. Well, like, I mean, I mean, I was still in grade school. I'm like, oh, what are they doing? Hmm, they're up there jumping in that pool. What's going on up there? Right? I'm like, oh, that looks fun. I want to do that. So I was baptized then. You notice there was no faith or repentance in that at all? I'm like, oh, that looks fun. I want to get up on stage and get wet, right? Um, so fast forward when I'm 18 and I commit my life to Christ and I really understand that I was baptized for real, for real that time. Um, there's no instruction within the word um, about rebaptism. It's not in there. Um, it is a matter between you and God to just, you know, house things going for you. So faith and repentance has to be a part of a true water baptism. It can't just be something that looks cool. Don't be getting baptized because we're going to give you a free shirt and a cool towel. Okay? Do not be getting baptized for those reasons. Um, and if, if, if your towel is anything like it is in our house, uh, nobody better lay a finger on George's baptism towel. It's like, that is mine. Get away from it. Uh, Christian baptism appoints us to work for the kingdom of God. Baptism in itself is a sign of the kingdom of God. So when we go through that water baptism experience, we are putting ourselves at work for the kingdom of God. Out of that, again, it is going to be one more step in our faith journey to help us to be able to say, man, I want to be baptized, but now that I've been baptized, I want to serve in the church. Now that I've been baptized, I want to go on a mission trip. Now that I've been baptized, I want to have a Bible study. Now that I'm, and it, it really throws us into the midst of working and being a part of God's kingdom, sometimes in ways that we never thought that we could do. So here's my kind of wrap up for this before I start talking about communion. If, 
If you're saying to yourself right now, I've not been baptized in water since I've become a true follower of Christ. If you're saying, hey, Bill, I, I was like you. I got baptized as a kid because it looked cool and it looked fun and I did it. And I haven't been baptized since. But you're saying, hey, I'm committed to Christ. If, if you're somebody who you were baptized at, at a portion in time and you were sold out for Christ and you were living for Christ and somehow life took you the total opposite way and you just went off the deep end, right? And you know that the life you were living was not pleasing to God. And if you've since come back to Christ and you've given your heart to him and there's kind of a stirring that says, man, I think I would like to be baptized again. If any reason right now in your heart is telling you, hey, I need to be baptized, then go and sign up for baptism. When's baptism going to happen? Whenever you sign up. We don't set aside Sundays for it to happen. Uh, we want this to be something that happens organically. And so um, we're going to ask you to go sign up. You can do it right from the Church Center app. There's a spot on there that says next steps, get baptized. You can do it online. Um, and there's just a few things there. And as soon as that happens, we begin to talk about what that is. So, so for anyone here, if you need to be baptized for any of those reasons, especially if you call yourself a Christian and you've never been baptized, here's your opportunity. Don't pass it up. Now, let me give you the other side is that not being baptized is not going to disqualify you from heaven, okay? Um, but it's very important that when we have the opportunity to do it, that we move forward with water baptism. So that's kind of my thing to you is, hey, if you want to be baptized in water, um, you know, teenagers in the room, older children in the room, have a talk with your parents if you want to, and we're going to get that scheduled. So, um, man... I would love to be able to like have my email blow up after church with all these baptism signups coming in and roll this thing out next Sunday and start off 2021 with a baptism service. Like that would be awesome to be able to have. And so um, you're going to get a t-shirt. So, uh, but don't let that be the only reason. So next I want to talk about communion. Um, uh, and uh, this, this is one of the second ordinances or practices of the church. And this is what uh, our um, fundamental statements say for the assemblies of God. The Lord's Supper, consisting of the elements, uh, bread, and the fruit of the vine, is the symbol expressing our sharing the divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ, a memorial of his suffering and death, and a prophecy of his second coming, and is enjoyed on all believers Till he come. So there's some questions that arise that I've heard through the years about water baptism. One of the most common, or uh, I mean communion, one of the most common questions I get about communion is, Pastor, why does that taste like a wafer? Why does that taste like styrofoam? Uh, you can't do better than that. I had a little girl come up to me once, and, and I, I, I hope to never forget this story. She came up and she said, Pastor, can you have Teddy Grahams for the kids when we take communion? Oh, my goodness. Oh, that was so sweet. But I get that question from kids and adults all together. Uh, you know, why does that taste like cardboard? To which I oftentimes want to say, I've never ate cardboard. So I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, I have tried foam because how many of you know that those packing nuts taste like Fritos? Some of y'all are going home. And you're getting some packing peanuts, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, it tastes like Fritos. Just don't swallow. I don't recommend swallowing. So, um, People will say, man, you know, why does the juice have to be sweet? Why does the juice have to be sour? All of these things that come with that. But, but the biggest question that I love is, hey, what does the wafer, the bread, the whatever we're going to use, what does that and, and what does the juice mean? And now we're getting down to the heart of communion. The wafer, the bread, whatever it is that we, you know, will, will be taken. Um, everybody, you can be relieved that we're not doing the single goblet for everyone today to drink out of. Um, so, no, I'm kidding. We don't do that regularly. Anybody ever been a part of that? Oh. I mean, if you've done that, you're probably immune from COVID. I don't know. 
Um, but the wafer of the bread is a symbol of Christ's body that was beaten, that was bruised, that went through torment, that like if you've seen the passion of the Christ, that was no comparison to what he really went through. You're like, man, that was gruesome. I can assure you that that was nowhere close because I don't think that the human mind can really try to portray what he went through to the extent. But the wafer, the bread, represents Jesus and everything that he went through for our sin. And he went and he had his body beaten and he had his body bruised, okay? He did, he did all of this to connect us. The juice represents Jesus' blood that was shed for us. He went to a cross and he shed his blood, every single ounce of his blood, uh, came up for us and he did that um, so that we can have a way to be part of the new covenant of the new commitment between God and man through Jesus. So big question comes to mind of why do we celebrate communion? Again, I could give the answer because Jesus did. And it would still be 100% biblical and 100% accurate because Jesus did. Jesus was part of communion. But I want to go a little bit deeper than that before we invite you to have communion with us. Communion is available to remember. It's to remember what Jesus endured. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in verse 23, this is, this is Paul talking to the church at Corinth, and he shares shares this in verse 23 for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup saying the cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me it's about remembering. It's about remembering what Jesus did. What you need to realize is that here, Jesus interpreted something old. Jesus was interpreting what the Old Testament talks about Passover. This, this is what Jesus was interpreting. He was interpreting the Passover meal. Exodus 12 describes the first Passover. It included a lamb. It included pure bread unleavened bread and though not specified in Exodus chapter 12 um, wine was part of that meal part of that celebration and Passover being that it was just a time for God to come come to Israel or to come to Egypt because he wanted his people set free from from the control that they had and they were told hey sacrifice your best lamb and paint your doorpost in that lamb's blood and the angel of death is going to pass over your house if that's not there he'll go on to the next one anyone who doesn't have it they will be put to death and so Jesus is interpreting something old why because he's ready to institute something new he, he interpreted something old in order to institute something new. Because now this ceremony quickly came to be celebrated in the church, especially in the Christian church, way more often than Passover. So communion is about remembering. It's also about rejoicing. Verse 26 For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It is about rejoicing. Notice there that it says whenever. Other, uh, other translations say as often. There's different ways for that. Um, don't get caught up on the frequency of communion. Don't get caught up on the frequency of communion. I will also remind you that you within your own home, you can celebrate communion anytime you want. We were with some friends last week. We celebrated communion in their living room, right? 
So as often as you do it, whenever you do it, do all of this, rejoice, proclaim until he comes. Stop thinking that some things are only reserved for church. They're not. I've taken communion to people. People have requested communion for them. Again, like I say, some people have done them in special occasions and such. So let's not get caught up on the frequency of communion. Look, New Life Assembly, we do not have, at least since uh, June 1st of 2018, there's no set communion schedule here. Um, And I know for some people it's taken them a while to get used to that. I've been a part of churches where they did it every week. I've been a part of churches where they did it the first Sunday of the month. I mean, you can set your watch by it, right? But for me, it's kind of been, I want this to be really special. And I don't know about you, but sometimes going back to why do they cut the meat off of the ends, sometimes when you do something over and over and over and over and over and over, somewhere along the way, it's probably going to lose its meaning and kind of that special thought that it has. Now, those churches, great churches. I served in them. They encouraged me. They encouraged my family. Great churches. If you know churches that do that, do not go and tell their pastor he's wrong. That's not what I'm saying here, okay? This is for me and the church that I lead. This is going to be, you know, kind of as the Holy Spirit talks about doing it because we're not going to get caught up on the frequency, but we're going to focus on the urgency of proclaiming his death, okay? Um, Communion isn't just kind of done to look back at what has happened, but pointing forward and rejoicing in the return of Christ. It's not just about the fact that he died, but it's also about the fact that he's coming back again. And um, so we've got remember, rejoice, and to repent. Verses 27 through 29. So so then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. Communion provides a time of personal reflection. Communion provides a time to examine ourselves and to think about what's going on in our lives. I remember back in my home church, and I was saved back in 2000 in Lancaster, Ohio. There was a song there that We did all the time there. Um, I don't even know the title, but I remember it saying, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. I would challenge you, is the Holy Spirit prompting you on something of that matter right now? Is the Holy Spirit prompting you with something in your life that there's something happening? It's not you. It's not you specifically. But is is there something in your life that if you were to come up here in a few moments, that you would be taking communion in an unworthy manner because of the things you do or things you fail to do. Now, in God's eyes, we, he sees us as worthy enough to receive his son. The things that we do makes us unworthy. So this isn't saying that you're a bad person or you're a terrible person. If you say, man, there's some things in my life that right now I know that they're not pleasing to God. I know that this thing in my life, I know this situation, I know this relationship, I know this habit, I know these thoughts, I know these things are not worthy of the calling of Christ on my life. 